Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos in our group reading of Julius Evola's Hermetic Tradition by finishing up our analysis of part one in this video through uh, covering uh, chapters 21 through 24 and therefore completing our preliminary education in the symbols of alchemy, which allows us in the next video to begin part two, which actually tells us about the practice of alchemy. I'd like to remind you that this is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts and is a response to a patron's request to do this group reading. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So, um, Ivola opens a chapter 21 titled Saturn Inverted Gold by saying that if you were to consider the classical contrast in alchemy between um, lead on one hand and gold on the other, it is important to recognize that aforementioned lead as the terrestrial element through which the human body is obedient to the forces of the mineral kingdom. This human self, qua mineral matter, is of course just the all too familiar image of the skeleton. This skeletal self, however, is not merely a negative obstacle which must be disregarded, let alone done away with, for this matter is exactly where Osiris and Saturn lie sleeping, says the alchemical literature. One goal of alchemy, then, is precisely to awaken these sleeping forces, but because Saturn is associated also with the vastly distant golden age, many alchemical texts refer to this as awakening the titans. Remember, they were those monstrous forces which uh, ran amok years ago before being subordinated to the ordering of gods like Zeus. So Saturn's double role as both the inverted gold of lead and the ancient divine power of the golden age might very well strike the reader as initially confusing, for one text does indeed note that both lead and gold are produced in Saturn by the same power. Well, this is perhaps stated more clearly in the symbolic hieroglyphs, which show the phoenix of those resurrected divine powers which lie latent within Saturn, through situating the symbol of the fire of sulfur immediately below him. Just as Saturn corresponds to that golden age, we find that each of the other ages, that is to say um, silver, bronze, iron, etc., each has a corresponding mode of human associated with them, but each of these must be understood as representing a certain subjective disempowerment in accord with the negative phenomenon of the historical reality of an ongoing trajectory of decline, which of course leads finally to the present Kali Yuga or Dark Age. The fact that Saturn remains latent within the skeletal self therefore means that the gold can be rediscovered only through elevating this lead rather than fleeing from it. We find in greater detail in chapter 22, the field and the seed, how exactly this is to be done. It's important to note that as we now near the very end of the first part of the text uh, covering the alchemical symbols, Evola warns that before we can actually move on to the second part dealing with practice, it is necessary to discuss the images of the seed, the field, and the flowering. If we briefly recall that the goal of alchemy is to bring about an awakening of those higher latent powers that lie sleeping within natural givens, such as, say, the human body, it makes sense to think of the latter as something of a fertile field, which only requires some work by the farmer to release all of that potential. The seed to be planted within that field is then just the vulgar gold, which appears as something dead when taken in a state of separation, but later comes to life if it is planted and allowed to grow. If you recall that Saturn was the god of both the vastly distant golden age and the god of farming, suddenly this obscure connection between the two makes much more sense. As the agrarian farmers knew, though, planting the seed in the earth is only the beginning of the story, it must be followed by a four-part uh, four growing cycle, which is itself divided up into the four seasons of the year. In the Hermetic tradition, each of these seasons had a different color associated with it, as the black winter was followed by the clear spring, then the red summer, and finally the golden fall, which is, of course, 
the time for harvesting. A perceptive reader will notice that the harvest, when Saturn can reclaim the resurrected potential that was only partially actualized in each of those three earlier phases, well, that is the Golden Age which Saturn himself had reigned over. Each of the earlier three seasons, then, correspond to the stages of decline only in reverse, with the Black Winter as the starting point in the Dark Iron Age which we already live in. What can we make of the requirement, though, that the seed be broken open before it can regain its life by growing? This is a reference, no doubt, to a sort of subjective crisis which is unavoidable. Well, we will find out in chapter 23, The Sword and the Rose, that this crisis is explained within the alchemical text, largely through the metaphorical symbology of, once again, plant life. The seed, under this view, is the ordinary man in the fallen state in which he lacks control over the strong forces even of his own body. Such a man is described as the king who is not a king, or perhaps we could say the king who is not yet the king he could be. How does the king reclaim that power, though, except through a fight, which is referenced metaphorically in phrases like kill the living, or the talk of using the power of the fiery dragon to strike, beat, or knock down the adversary? In the aftermath of that strike, though, in which the adversary is not exactly who you might assume it would be, one has to pass from the active state one had been in before, albeit in a somewhat um, uh, confused and incomplete sense, to a pacifized state analogous to the seed's temporary death and burial within the earth, which even Jesus himself had mentioned in the Gospels. Only the seed that dies can really come back to life later as a full-grown plant. Well, while we're on the subject of Jesus Christ, it is interesting that some Hermetic authors actually have drawn an explicit connection to the symbolism of the crucifixion, insofar as the aforementioned strike results in a horizontal, knocked-down state, which, after cutting across the vertical line, does indeed result in the all-too-familiar sign of the cross. It bears mentioning, too, that the horizontal line pierces the vertical in just the same way as the centurion's spear had pierced the side of Jesus at the um, hour of his death, causing the two successive phases of first white water and then red blood to spill out analogous to two phases of the work within the alchemical tradition, too. Well, if you recall the Nicene Creed, after Jesus died on the cross, he descended into the earth, or rather he descended below the earth to visit hell, before returning again upwards in a resurrected form that actually could succeed in carrying out the ascension into heaven. Well, in the plant world, this return to verticality is even more familiarly captured in the image of the lotus flower. This is one which grows vertically above the water, but whose roots extend all the way down into the abyssal mud of the earth. And it does this in order to fix the solar principle of the sun in a glorious flower which is high up somewhere in the air. But what about that fire? The alchemical texts tell us that the rising stem, stem will burn the soul and consume the combustible impurities of the stone. By returning life to the dead, it will ironically reach the point where the fire has no power over it, says the text. Well, in chapter 24, Stem, Virus, and Iron, we learn that the stem referenced earlier is often um, talked about by the Greek alchemists as something of a virus, in the sense of a property within the metal that leads to its oxidation given the fact that the resulting rust in the metal would have a reddish color. This red symbolizes a new solar force manifesting itself within a base metal which might perhaps have earlier seemed unworthy of it. This rusting is therefore called a purification because it causes the flower to appear on the stem, which, as we recall, is just the fixing of the solar principle in an elevated position within the air.
This fire of the rusting process is, however, described in the tradition as an unnatural fire, or a fire against nature itself, because the motion which it sets into action, leading to that higher state, is not simply a free ability, which is already given to us by lower nature itself. In Aristotelian terms, this is not simply a hardwired part of Ephesus. This fire against nature is therefore easily recognized <clears throat> within the spiritual tradition as the suspension of desire. The point of this, then, is to overcome the instability and flux of mere becoming in order to rise up to, to the stability of being. The iron that has successfully passed through fire and water to become such being is, of course, steel, which the text emphasizes is the required matter of alchemical practice. If you have the steel, all that remains is to learn the practice of alchemy itself, as the rest of this book shall do.